In this video, we'll be going over 10 cards which are greatly improved versions of their original, but aren't necessarily retranscreated to replace them, and more of an evolution of what the cards should be in order to compete in the modern metagame. And at number 10, we have Power Angel Valkyria. This card is the evolution of Dunaim's Dark Witch, a level 4 vanilla monster with 1800 attack. So it was actually kind of on the high end back in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh, and was one of the highest attack level 4 monsters in Duel Links for a while. Power Angel Valkyria has the exact same stats as the original, except it actually has an effect, where if you negate the activation of a card, you get to add one light fairy type monster from your deck to your hand. So it's basically counter fairy support, a series of cards all about gaining advantage after countering your opponent's plays. Although this is one of the few counter fairies which doesn't specifically require a counter trap card to be activated. So you can gain the advantage if you just negate the effects with monster effects, or any other way. Just as long as you negate the activation of the card, and not just negate the card itself with something like Effect Veiler. So it is kinda specific, but if you only use counter trap cards you don't have to worry about it, because pretty much all of them counter the activation. Now that being said, counter fairies themselves don't really see competitive play anymore, and this card came out way late after they stopped seeing play, so its time to shine is basically only occasionally in Duel Links. And at number 9 we have Kaiser Vorse Raider. This is the evolution of Vorse Raider, another high attack neural monster from the early days of the game. This one being one of two vanilla monsters that had 1900 attack, sharing that distinction with Gemini Elf, who was the first vanilla monster of 1900 attack, and saw a lot of competitive play because of that, when having a high attack on a level 4 monster used to be a big deal. Now what this evolution does is it has the same stats except for one little distinction where it's actually one level higher than the original, being a level 5 monster. Which you would think would make it worse, since a 1900 attack monster that's level 5 is actually kind of bad. But it does have the effect to special summon itself from your hand if you control no monsters, which is actually a good effect for a high level monster to have. It also has another effect that if it destroys a monster by battle it gains 500 attack. And if this card is destroyed by battle, the monster who destroyed it loses 500 attack. Both of these effects are permanent, so the more this card attacks over things, the stronger and stronger it gets. Which would have been great if this card was released a little bit earlier in the TCG, but since the card came out in 2016, it didn't see any competitive play. The fact that it can special summon itself from the hand means it has potential to see play in the future though. Generally, cards with niche effects to special summon themselves come into the meta whenever a deck is introduced that just happens to allow the card to work with whatever the new gimmick of the archetype is. Currently, it doesn't fit into any of those gimmicks, and only enjoys some niche success in Duel Links, where cards like this kind of shine in that much more limited format. And at number 8, we have Citadel Well. This card is the evolution of Fortress Well, an old level 7 ritual monster with no effect, which kind of has mediocre stats for how difficult it was to bring out, and of course, you know, having a lack of an effect. So the original didn't really see play, and the evolved form is much better. Citadel Well has the exact same stats as the original, but it's not a ritual, and it's a lot easier to bring out, as it can bring itself out by tributing any two water monsters you control while this card is in your hand or graveyard. Being able to bring itself out from the graveyard is great. The availability of being able to do it from the hand as well is just icing on the cake. That means it's not a dead card in your hand and you can't brick in a deck that's trying to bring the card out. When this card is special summoned, you can set one sea stealth attack directly from your deck, which is a trap card that allows level 5 or higher water monsters to destroy whatever they battle at the start of the damage step, meaning all of your level 5 or higher water monsters gain the Ally of Justice Cataster effect, which is really good. It's so good that it was kind of a head scratcher why they added this card in Sea Stealth Attack to Duel Links, because it was a little bit too strong in that version of the game, and it absolutely saw play. Tons of heavy competitive play at that. In the actual TCG, it didn't see play at all. Citadel Well came out in 2017, when the TCG had Zodiacs, which are like 10 times stronger than anything Citadel Well can put on the board, unfortunately. Although that's not it with Citadel Well, it also has an extra effect, where once per turn if your opponent activates a card or effect that targets one water monster you control, you can just negate the activation and destroy that card. There is no other cost as negation, only the limitation that the effect only targets one water monster and no other cards, which is actually pretty good inherent protection. And the card Sea Stealth Attack has a quick effect, where you can banish a water monster you control until the end phase to make it so your face-up spell and trap cards cannot be destroyed by your opponent's card effects. 
which actually gave protection to your water monsters as well, because you could just banish them for a turn in order to activate the effect to protect your back row from any kind of removal. It was incredibly hard to out Citadel well and see stealth attacking dual links, although even that format evolved to a point where it's not that big of a deal anymore. And at number 7, we have Sentry Soldier of Stone. This card is the evolution of Giant Soldier of Stone, another vanilla monster from the early days of the game. Giant Soldier of Stone used to see play back in the day because it was the highest defense of a level 4 or lower monster that also had the highest attack point value at 1300. So you would just set Giant Soldier of Stone as a wall, since your opponent couldn't beat over it with any level 4 or lower monsters, and then if you were able to remove your opponent's cards, it had the decent option to actually attack as well for a respectable amount of damage. That's obviously not how the normal metal game works in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, or even Duel Links for that matter, so the card no longer sees play. And now we have the evolved version of Sentry Soldier of Stone, which has the same exact stats as the original, and has the effect that while it's in the graveyard, if all the monsters you control are rock type, and you control at least one monster, then this card can special summon itself from the graveyard, with the only drawback that this is a hard once per turn. So the card can just bring itself out from the graveyard without any kind of resource cost other than a field state, which is really good actually. If you have the conditions for this card set up, that's just a plus one every turn, which may surprise you to hear that the card didn't really see play unlike the previous spots. It just kind of came in a little bit too late in its lifetime, and the only meta deck that does use rock monsters that came out recently, and haven't really had a chance to appear in any top events to really count for these kinds of lists, but I think even they didn't use Sentry Soldier of Stone. But in Duel Links, they have a skill in the game called Centrification, which just straight up allows you to, once per duel, just turn all copies of Giant Soldier of Stone in your graveyard into copies of Sentry Soldier of Stone which is pretty much one of the few direct confirmations of a card evolution in game into a better version of itself. And at number 6, we have Cocoon of Ultra Evolution. This card is the evolution of the monster card Cocoon of Evolution. The normal Cocoon of Evolution always kind of worked like an equip spell card anyway, where you can equip the card from your hand to a face-up Petite Moth you controlled as an equip card, which would then give that card the attack and defense of Cocoon of Evolution, and then allowed you to eventually summon the other forms of Petite Moth, where if you managed to keep the card alive for 6 turns, you got to summon perfectly ultimate Great Moth from your hand. Although this was one of the worst boss monsters in the game's history because it was too difficult to bring out for not really enough of a payoff, so it was laughably bad as a joke. And Cocoon of Evolution only saw play because of its high defense for a low level monster, completely ignoring the effect the card had. Now, the Evolution version, Cocoon of Ultra Evolution, does a much better job of bringing out the same card, where it has the quick effect that allows you to tribute an insect-type monster from either side of the field, which is equipped with an equip card, to then special summon any insect-type monster from your deck, ignoring its summoning conditions, which does allow you to actually bring out perfectly ultimate Great Moth from your deck. So if you use the card Parasite Paranoid, which itself is the evolved form of Parasite Parasite, Paranoid allows you to equip it from your hand to your opponent's monster, and then basically treat that card if it's an insect-type monster, which allows you to fulfill the conditions of Cocoon of Ultra Evolution to then special summon a perfectly ultimate Great Moth from your deck. Although that's not really a good target. Really, the best target for this card would be the evolved form of Insect Queen, Metamorphosed Insect Queen, who has the effect that it cannot be normal summoned or set, and can only be special summoned by the effect of a card effect, and it has a whole bunch of great effects that protect and involve insect-type monsters. Although Cocoon of Ultra Evolution goes on to have a graveyard effect, where you can banish it from the graveyard to then return an insect-type monster from your graveyard to your deck in order to draw one card. And this graveyard effect is actually good too. Some might say it's even better than its first effect, because it's just straight up advantage. Whereas the first effect isn't actually that useful, since it doesn't have a super good target outside of Metamorphosed Insect Queen as it was kind of made as an easier way to bring out perfectly ultimate Great Moth anyway. But in Yu-Gi-Oh! Speed Duels, they have a character skill called Cocoon of Ultra Evolution, which basically allows you to use the effects of Cocoon of Ultra Evolution just without having to use a card in your deck, and always having it available, but with the caveat that you're only able to use either of its effects once per duel. And as far as I know, this is currently the strongest skill card in Yu-Gi-Oh! Speed Duels so I guess it did eventually see some success. 
even if it doesn't really see play in normal Yu-Gi-Oh! or in Duel Links. And at number 5, we have Ancient Gear Reactor Dragon. This card is the evolution of Ancient Gear Gadgetron Dragon, who itself was introduced in the second wave of Ancient Gear support alongside Gear Town. The original Ancient Gear Gadgetron Dragon was meant as the target to be special summoned with the effect of Gear Town, which is the field spell card that has the effect that when it's destroyed you get to special summon an Ancient Gear monster from your hand deck or graveyard. And since the hallmark of the archetype, Ancient Gear Golem, has the effect where it cannot be special summoned, Ancient Gear Gadgetron Dragon was the second best target, as it had 3000 attack and the ability to shut down your opponent's spell or traps when it declared an attack. It also had some other effects to gain additional effects if it was brought up properly through tribute summons, as long as you tribute some of the gadget monsters, which wasn't really worth it. This card was brought out most of the time through Gear Town's effect. Ancient Gear Reactor Dragon was brought out in a much later wave of Ancient Gear support, as the new best target to bring out with Gear Town, as it's one level higher, has 3000 attack and defense instead of just 3000 attack and also has extra effects if it's brought out properly through tribute summons with gadget monster tributes, although that doesn't really happen either. The main use of this card is the fact that when it declares an attack, your opponent can't activate any card effects at all, not just spell or traps, so it also allows you to negate the effect of monster effects during the damage step as well. And also at the end of the damage step, if it attacked, you get to destroy one spell or trap card in the field. Not only does it have more protection than the original, it also allows you to gain advantage from attacks going through by popping back row, or destroying additional copies of Gear Town to special summon another copy of Reactor Dragon from your deck, or destroying Ancient Gear Fortress to special summon copies from your graveyard. So a single Ancient Gear Reactor Dragon could allow you to bring out the other two copies by destroying your own cards, and then getting rid of some of your opponent's back row as well. The card did actually see some play in the TCG and a couple variants of True Draco decks in 2018 but it saw the most amount of success in Duel Links, where this card kind of came out alongside Ancient Gear Gadgetron Dragon, which is kind of funny that the evolution immediately power crept its original version right out the gate in that game. And at number 4, we have Gaia the Magical Knight of Dragons. This card is the evolution of Gaia the Dragon Champion, who himself has a retrain in the form of Galloping Gaia the Dragon Champion. So really, Gaia the Magical Knight of Dragons is like the second evolution of the card, and even after having two retrains and two new waves of support, it still didn't really see competitive play. Although the final version of it is pretty good. It can be brought out with any Gaia the Fierce Knight monster and a level 5 Dragon type monster as its fusion materials, and has the effect on the field, where its name becomes Gaia the Dragon Champion. That way it gains benefit from the support of Spiral Spear Strike, which gives the card piercing battle damage and allows it to go plus 1 if you inflict battle damage. It also has two other effects, where the monster gains an additional 2600 attack if it destroys a monster by battle, which is a huge attack boost. It literally doubles its attack after successfully destroying anything by battle. And with its special fusion spell card, Spiral Fusion, it can come out right out the gate with an additional 2600 attack and two attacks on monsters. So if brought out with its fusion spell card and attacking over any one monster by battle, this card ends its first turn with 7800 attack which definitely helps it activate its other effect where it has a quick effect during the main phase that allows you to destroy any one other card in the field at the cost of reducing this monster's attack by 2600. So the reason it gains ridiculous amounts of attack is because it loses a ridiculous amount of attack in order to activate its quick effect, which is pretty good. This card gains a lot of attack, but that's because it requires the cost of paying a lot in order to spell speed to destroy things, which is pretty fitting for the card. The fusion spell card that brings it out also allows it to attack two monsters during the battle phase. So if your opponent just has two monsters below 2500 attack, you can kind of win the duel with a single battle phase of this card being out. Although even with its ridiculous attack gain and pretty decent spell speed to destruction effect, it doesn't really see competitive play because it's a tiny bit too hard to bring out because it's real fragile to a little disruption. It's actually not that hard to bring out, it's just real easy to stop with common hand traps or a single negate, which isn't good enough in modern Yu-Gi-Oh to see competitive play. It is still an excellent evolution over the original counterpart of the card though. And at number 3 we have Trishula, Sub-Zero Dragon of the Ice Barrier. This card is the evolution of Trishula, Dragon of the Ice Barrier, a card that's really good in its own right and was even banned for a couple of years for being a little bit too good. Most of these cards in these videos are retrains of bad cards, or just cards that have since been power crept out of the game. 
but this is the only one which has an evolution of an already good card that still exists in the game and is not out yet as of making this video. Which is probably the only reason I don't have the number one, because it looks pretty good from everything I can see about it. The card has the exact same stats in so many conditions as the original Trishula, with the biggest difference being the level, as Sub-Zero is level 11, whereas the original is level 9, which is kind of a big deal with Synchro Summons, so I guess it technically doesn't have the exact same summoning condition. It does require one tuner plus two or more non-tuner monsters for its summon, and when it's brought out, it allows you to banish three of your opponent's cards without targeting any of them, if I'm reading its translated effect correctly. The original Trishula also allows you to do this, except it banishes three cards from three different places, one of them from your opponent's hand, field, and graveyard, whereas Sub-Zero can only banish three cards from your opponent's side of the field. However, Sub-Zero goes on to have an additional effect, where if this card is destroyed by an opponent's card, you can special summon a copy of Trishula, Dragon of the Ice Barrier, from your extra deck or graveyard, and if you do, its attack is changed to 3300, and then the attack of all of your opponent's face-up monsters become half, as well as all of their effects being permanently negated. So basically, it floats into the original Trishula on death, and then completely shuts down your opponent's boards of monsters by permanently cutting all their attacks in half, as well as permanently negating all their effects, which is actually pretty decent. This might be one of the best floating effects in the game, since it allows you to cheat out monster and completely shut down your opponent's board at the same time. Or at least just a really good floating effect. I guess it would technically be better if it could remove all of your opponent's monsters instead of just disabling them. Now, as an evolution of an already powerful card, I'm honestly not sure if it's better. One of the reasons the original Trishula is so good is because the card can banish a card from your opponent's hand, and the effect is not once per turn. So if you're able to bring out multiple copies of Trishula and somehow recycle its effect, you could use it to get rid of all cards in your opponent's hand, which is super powerful. Outside of that, it's also just good to banish your opponent's cards without targeting any of them, while coincidentally getting rid of priority targets in the graveyard, and a random one from your opponent's hand. In comparison, just being able to get rid of three cards your opponent controls in the field might not be as good, but it is still very strong since, again, it doesn't target any of these three cards, so it still goes to show if Trishula Sub-Zero Dragon of the Ice Bear will be a proper evolution over the original card, which is why it's only at number three for now, only beaten out by two other cards which have actually seen competitive play in the past. And at number two, we have red Eye Zombie Necro Dragon. This card is the evolution of red Eye Zombie Dragon, who himself is a retrain of red Eye's Black Dragon. So red Eye Zombie Necro Dragon is the evolved form of a card, which is a retrain of a different card, so it's two different levels of evolutions in a way, except a retrain isn't really the same thing as an evolution. They are incredibly similar though, to the point where I'm only making a distinction for this video. Now, what Red Eye Zombie Necro Dragon does is it has generic materials for a level 7 synchro monster, gains 100 attack and defense for each zombie monster on the field and in both players' graveyards, and it has the effect that when a zombie monster is destroyed by battle, you can special summon a zombie monster from either player's graveyard to your side of the field, and you can only use this effect once per turn. Now, the original Red Eye Zombie Dragon has the effect that when it destroys a zombie monster by battle, you could special summon that zombie monster to your side of the field. And the way all of this would work, realistically, is thanks to the field spell card called Zombie World, which treats all monsters in the field and in both players' graveyards as zombie-type monsters while it's out. So with Zombie World and the original Red Eye Zombie Dragon, you could basically special summon any monster destroyed by battle. Whereas Red Eye Zombie Necro Dragon allows you to special summon any monster from either player's graveyard when basically any monster is destroyed on the field by battle. So if another one of your zombie monsters is destroyed by an opponent's monster by battle, you can then special summon any monster from either player's graveyard. Or if you use any of your zombie monsters to destroy any of your opponent's zombie monsters, you can then special summon any zombie monster from either player's graveyard. So basically, it's just real easy to bring out anything from either player's graveyard when this card is on the field. And of course, when you have Zombie World out, which is really easy to bring out thanks to some of the really good Zombie World support in the form of Necro World Banshee, a monster that allows you to banish it from the graveyard to activate Zombie World directly from your deck on an effect which is Quick Effect. So it's real easy to get Necro World Banshee into the graveyard because zombie monsters are some of the best types of monsters in the game at sending other zombies to the graveyard, with stuff like Unizombie, Gozuki, or Avenged Red Savior. 
And since Zombie World control decks also have easy access to tuner monsters, it wasn't that hard to bring out either with any combination of ways. So it saw play in Zombie World control decks in the past, only really losing steam once Eldritch the Golden Lord came out and kind of changed how Zombie World control decks played, where they don't really care about Red Eyes Zombie Necro Dragon anymore, but it did contribute to a lot of top spots and a whole bunch of Zombie World control decks in the past, which is why it definitely takes a higher spot on this list. And at number one, we have Endymion the Mighty Master of Magic. This card is the evolution of Endymion the Master of Magic, a card which was released in a wave of spell counter support cards, which didn't really help make spell counters a viable strategy. As the original had the effect that the card could special summon itself from your hand or graveyard by removing six spell counters from the field spell card Magical Citadel of Endymion. A field spell card which could place spell counters on itself each time a spell card was activated, and could have spell counters transferred to the card when cards with spell counters were destroyed on the field. So theoretically, it was supposed to be easy to get a whole bunch of spell counters on the field spell card, but that wasn't really a good way to use spell counters, which is kind of why the whole mechanic fell flat. The original Endymion also had the effect that it was summoned in this way you could add one spell card from the graveyard to your hand, and then once per turn you could discard a spell card in order to destroy one card in the field. So its effect on the field didn't even use spell counters in a meaningful way either, which is why the card didn't really see much competitive success. Now the evolved version of it, and Demion the Mighty Master of Magic, definitely allows spell counters to actually be useful, and also has some of the longest card techs in the game, a distinction shared by other cards within its same archetype. Although part of the reason this card has such a bloated card text is because it handles cards which can hold spell counters on them, and there's no real way to describe a card on the field which has the ability to have a spell counter on them in a short amount of words. So the card is a pendulum monster, and has two separate effects depending on if it's on the field as a spell card or as a monster, where its pendulum effect basically boils down to you can remove six spell counters on the field to special summon this card, then it destroys cards in the field up to the amount of cards you control which can have spell counters, then it applies spell counters to itself up to the number of cards it destroyed. While it's a monster, it has the effect that if it has any spell counters, it can't be destroyed or targeted by your opponent's card effects. And if it's destroyed by battle while it has a spell counter on it, you get to add a normal spell card from your deck to your hand. It also has a negate, where if your opponent activates a spell or trap effect, you can return a card you control that has spell counters on it to your hand in order to negate and destroy that card, then distribute the spell counters from that return card to this card. So lots of wordy things to describe moving spell counters around and using spell counters, and cards that can potentially have spell counters on them where the spell counters on those cards go after they get returned to the hand and stuff. The effects are actually pretty simple, even if it does kind of have a lot of effects on top of the fact that it's kind of wordy to describe those effects. But basically, it's a negate on the field, can special summon itself from the pendulum zone, and can destroy a whole bunch of cards when it special summons itself. And then it floats into the search of a normal spell card on its death, which is one of the best kinds of search you can have in the game. Normal spell cards are some of the hardest type of cards to search out in the game. And this card absolutely saw competitive play, and was kind of the cornerstone of one of the only viable pendulum decks for a while, and is still a pretty good go-to card for viable pendulum decks even to this day. Alright, and that's the video. There are a ton of card evolutions in the game, so much of them that I could possibly do a part 2 video if there's any interest. As always, if you have any ideas for future videos just like this one, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments. And also, did you know, only about 30% of people who watch these videos are actually subscribed to the channel.